and good day to all. Thank you for joining today's webinar on South South Cooperation, creating headways for post pandemic inclusive recovery. I'm Huma Bloj speaking to you from Comsec Secretariat in Islamabad and welcoming you to this virtual gathering that is being held to commemorate the United Nations Day for South South Cooperation, which is observed on 12th September every year. Our aim is to raise awareness on the importance of South South Cooperation and what role can South South Cooperation play in supporting the developing countries in their post pandemic inclusive recovery. We have a fantastic panel of experts here today who will share their institutional experiences and elaborate on the approaches to scale up South South Cooperation and the challenges faced by their organization in engaging in South South Cooperation. So I'm gonna start by introducing to you the Executive Director of Comsex. Dr. Akhtar Nazir is the Interim Executive Director of Comsex. He assumed the office after taking charge as a Federal Secretary, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of Pakistan on 27th of July this year. An officer of Pakistan Administrative Services, Dr. Nazir has vast administrative experiences and served on deputation at different departments of federal and provisional governments of Pakistan. In the recent time, he has served as a Secretary, Election Commission of Pakistan, Secretary, Senate Secretariat, and Chief Secretary, Government of Balochistan. So I will hand over to our Executive Director for his opening remark. So you have the virtual stage. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. My name is Dr. Akhtar Nareen. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and some of my colleagues, very good morning. On behalf of the Commission on Science and Technology for Sustainable Development in the South, I extend my warm welcome to the participants of the webinar, which is being held to commemorate the UN Day for South South Cooperation. I am particularly grateful to the honorable heads and representatives of international organizations, that is United Nations Office for South South Cooperation, Alliance of International Science Organizations, South Center, Inter-Academy Partnership, the Network of African Science Academies and Islamic World Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization who are participating in the event as speakers. Even aims at providing a forum to the representatives of international organizations, UN agencies and other donor and development organizations to share institutional experiences, lessons learned, and the best practices in implementing science and technology programs through South-South and triangular cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, the world is currently facing a major challenge in the form of COVID-19 which has affected millions of people around the world. It has affected all sectors and further aggravated the already prevalent challenges such as poverty, illiteracy, hunger, and food insecurity. Overcoming these challenges would inter alia require enhanced global cooperation in the fields of science and technology. In this context, South-South and triangular cooperation in education, research, innovation, capacity building, policy making, and infrastructure development is more important than ever before. I'm certain that you would therefore find this even relevant and beneficial in this context. In the wake of current pandemic, the importance and usefulness of fields such as information technology has increased many folds. The aftermath of COVID-19 necessitates adopting new means and accepting new norms in conducting day-to-day -day life and business. Digital transformation is now a must for efficiently running government affairs, doing businesses, and facilitating social activities. There is a dire need to enhance capacities of the developing countries in this domain in order to ensure inclusive recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, the collaboration in healthcare sector to overcome the ongoing pandemic has become a prerequisite. We must make conscious efforts to develop mechanisms for preventing spread of such pan pandemics in future. Biotechnology sector has so far played an immensely important role in global efforts for combating the pandemic. The world would need to enhance its focus in this field in future. Furthermore, small and medium enterprises have been affected greatly by the pandemic and would require support from the governments and international development organizations. 
ladies and gentlemen comsats is ready to join hands with the like minded institutions belonging to the developing as well as developed countries particularly international organizations in order to contribute towards the post pandemic inclusive recovery as you are aware that comsats is an international intergovernmental organization established in 1994 having its secretariat in islamabad presently comsat has 27 member states across three continents africa asia and latin america it has heads of state government of the member states as commission members the organizational mission of comsats is to act as a catalyst for south south cooperation creating awareness about the developmental opportunities offered by emerging technologies sharing good practices and promoting such changes in national policies that can bring science and technology at the core of development agendas various forums under comsats flag bring together government of, of officials scientists researchers and academicians from countries of the south the relevant ministers senior government officials of the member countries contribute at the forum of consultative committees while the heads of 24 international science and technology centers of excellence play the role at the platform of coordinating council these forums help in sensitizing the policy makers on contemporary science and technological issues ladies and gentlemen in its 27 years of journey the overarching initiatives of the organization have promoted indigenous capacity building collaborative research and development sharing of knowledge experiences good practices and technological resources the objective has been to benefit from the intellectual scientific and academic resources available in the global south comsats has so far conducted more than 350 high level capacity building and training activities nationally regionally and internationally in the scientific fields relevant to the socio economic development of south the organization is also contributing through providing opportunities for post graduate scholarships post doctoral fellowships and short term trainings to students and researchers from its member countries distinguished participants in the realm of research and development six international thematic groups were constituted in various science and technology fields with the aim of addressing common challenges being faced by countries of the south the recently established comsats joint center for industrial biotechnology ccib at the tianjin institute of industrial biotechnology tib china the center of excellence of comsats is promoting meaningful cooperation amongst the southern countries through facilitating collaborative research and development activities academic exchanges personnel training as well as science and technological consultation services in 2019 Comsat Center for Climate and Sustainability was established which is working together with institutions from the global south in promoting climate resilience and sustainable development through south south and triangular cooperation by bringing together global and regional partners to promote connectivity consultation and collaboration for implementation of the 2015 Paris Agreement and achievement of relevant goals of the 2030 development agenda ladies and gentlemen the talks by the honorable speakers and the healthy discussion subsequently will hopefully guide us to new ways and means to integrate bring in harmony in our efforts and to fight and mitigate the effects of covid-19 in order to achieve the common goal of inclusive recovery in the post pandemic period i am confident that we can collectively address any issues that is impending sustainable development of the south and then i once again thank you all for making possible to participate in this webinar and hope that you will find it productive thank you very much thank you so much dr nazee for this comprehensive overview of uh, comsats now we will hear from dr adil abdul latif director of uh, united nations office in new york and dr azhar abdul latif will be speaking to us by a pre recorded video message to mark the un international day for south south cooperation dr adil abdul latif 
before joining UNO SSC, he served as Deputy Director and Senior Strategic Advisor in the Regional Bureau for Arab States of the United Nations Development Program. He took the lead in launching uh, three regional initiatives of UNDP in the Arab States region, including those on good governance, water governance, regional trade facilitation, social cohesion, and women's empowerment. He came to UNDP following a two-decade career as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Officer. Kindly play the video message. Uh, the technical team in another room, can you please check because we are unable to hear the voice recording and play it from the very start. Okay. Uh, 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 what? Okay, uh, yeah. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to join you today at this webinar on South South Cooperation, creating headways for post pandemic inclusive recovery as we mark this year's United Nations Day for South-South Cooperation, highlighting solidarity in support of a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable future. At the onset, I would like to thank Comsats for their long-standing partnership with the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation and would like to commend the work for championing South-South cooperation to strengthening countries' capacities to develop science-based solutions to respond to global challenges by pooling their knowledge and resources. Southern countries have been leveraging science, technology, and innovation to respond to COVID-19. These include scientific cooperation in sharing of vaccination, technology, production, innovations in telecommuting solutions, the use of artificial intelligence to monitor viral outbreaks, the expansion of e-commerce and use of telemedicine, digital financial services and e-learning in order to build resilient societies. Today, countries are facing common challenges in the current COVID-19 pandemic. They are interconnected national economies, have contracted due to the various lockdowns and travel restrictions, in addition to health and other socioeconomic crises. This at the same time has also revealed that the business as usual will no longer work, thus making digital transformation a key to accelerating our progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals. Through South-South cooperation, Developing countries can collaborate to enhance their opportunities and collectively face the challenges in the digital era. The recent approval of the United Nations system-wide strategy in South-South cooperation is a great leap forward in mainstreaming South-South cooperation within the UN system. It aims to galvanize a coordinated and coherent approach to policy programmatic and partnership support in South, South and Triangular cooperation and increase impact across United Nations activities at all levels, national, regional, and global. The United Nations Office for South, South cooperation 
will continue to enrich and expand its large database on South South and Triangle cooperation good practices in order to make them accessible to all countries in the global South. Every country has experiences and success to share and learn from regardless of their development status. This is also facilitated by South, South Galaxy, a digital global knowledge sharing and partnership brokering platform managed by the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation. Knowledge shared through South, South Galaxy not only provides access to these good practices to learn from and replicate, but also to connect solution providers with solution seekers and facilitate cross-country and cross-regional partnerships and collaborations. We'd like to encourage you to engage on this platform, which not only will allow you to access and share knowledge, but can also facilitate in identifying areas for joint and collaborative activities that are best suited for matching needs. Let us coordinate our efforts to scale up Southern development successes, share them widely, through enhanced cooperation, build a strong recovery, and achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. Wish you all a fruitful discussion ahead. Thank you. Okay, so before starting the uh presentation and talks from the speakers. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. If you have a question, please type it in a chat session. And during the discussion and question answer session of the webinar, we will ask the questions to the speakers. However, question we are unable to answer due to time constraints will be followed up directly by email after the webinar. So now I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Carlos Maria Correa who is the executive director of the South Center since July 2018. Dr. Korea is a well-known international lawyer and academic with a deep expertise and experience on the issues that affect developing countries such as on international trade, intellectual property, health, technology transfer, and investment policy. He has been a consultant to many UN agencies, FNO, UNIDO, SALA, ECLEC, WHO, the board of Cartagena Agreement, IDB, the World Bank, and the Secretariat of Convention on Biological Diversity um, on Intellectual Property Development and Technology Digital Transfer. So I'm turning the virtual stage to you over, uh, over to you, Dr. Kuria. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting the South Center to participate at this important event. And we certainly celebrate the UN Day on South South Cooperation, the South Center in itself is a manifestation of SASAO cooperation. It was established by developing countries and it works for developing countries, the, the global south. Let me then just uh, make a few comments about the importance of SASAO cooperation in the context of COVID-19 and beyond. The first observation I will make is that um, one of the lessons that we can draw from this uh, health socioeconomic crisis is that the multilateral system has shown its fragilities in order to address a global situation like this. In particular, the World Health Organization has lacked the tools in order to operate as a global public health agenda. Another lesson from, from this uh, emergency or crisis is the importance, is about the importance of the role of science and technology in addressing human needs, such as in the case of this emergency. In fact, there is a paradox in this regard. On the one hand, science has proven to be effective in developing very rapidly a number of vaccines in order to address COVID-19. So there has been a scientific success as we know, a dozen or so vaccines are already, already available. Many others are in development. And this has been made in record time. So this is a successful story for science and technology. However, on the other side, in terms of uh, policy, in terms of implementation of a global solution, 
that would provide in particular an equal distribution of vaccines, the system has failed. So there is a major failure in, in connection with the way in which the COVID-19 crisis has been managed or mismanaged. There has been a global failure for the international community, in particular, in order to ensure that all populations around the world, including developing countries and the poor countries, would receive uh, sufficient uh, doses of vaccines. But one of the key issues um, regarding this, this, this problem of uh, unequal distribution of vaccines relates to the, to the insufficient supply, the shortage of supply. And this is a consequence of the lack of sufficient manufacturing capacity. And in turn, this is the, the consequence of the lack of sharing of technologies. So here, here we see that the role of technology has been crucial in relation to the way in which this crisis has been managed. As we know, the Western companies have been uh, reluctant, have not been willing to share the technologies. For instance, in the context of the World Organization, the CTAP was established as a pool for technology. But the Western companies that were able to rapidly develop vaccines did not share the technologies. So a clear lesson also from, from this crisis is that science and technology is crucial in order to address these uh, global problems, such as uh, health security, but the policy framework we have is not sufficient in order to ensure that scientific and technological progress is translated into actions at the global level that uh, actually address the needs of the global uh, population. So that, that's an important lesson I think we, we, we can draw from, from the current emergency. A second lesson I'd like to refer to is that despite the asymmetry that uh, still exists in terms of uh, north-south capacities in science and technology, there has been a lot of progress in the last 25 years in science and technology in the south. So let, let me just refer a few uh, indicators. One important indicator is the, the research and development uh, statistics is provided by research and development statistics. 25 years ago, only around 6% of the global research and development was conducted in developing countries. Today, more than 20% of research and development at the global, global scale is conducted in developing countries. Of course, the very significant increase of uh, research and development investment in China explains to a large extent this uh, growth in the participation of developing countries in research and development at the global level. But that's one indicator. Another indicator is what actually happened uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only Western companies were able to develop vaccines, but there have been important developments also in developing countries. In fact, the first vaccine for COVID-19 was developed in a developing country in China. Also, India has been able to develop uh, vaccines. Um, it's, India is also a major world producer of vaccines uh, through the Serum Institute, uh, as we know. Cuba has been able to develop at least five vaccines candidates. Two of them have already been approved for, for emergency. So Cuba is a very interesting case of a small country which has been able to develop a, a very strong biotechnological industry, uh, which may be able to provide vaccines, uh, not only to the Cuban population, but also to other developing countries. And uh, other countries uh, such as uh, Thailand and also China, have been able to move even in the, in the context of uh, more complex technologies, such as the messenger RNA technology, the platform that uh, has allowed the rapid development of some vaccines. So there are also vaccines uh, which are under development using this new and perhaps more sophisticated um, platform. So progress in, in science and technology in the South has also contributed to uh, address uh, the situation created by, by COVID-19. And this, this has also been a context in which cooperation has taken place uh, among the countries of the South. For instance, uh, the China mRNA vaccine 
is being a child in, in Mexico. Trials are conducted in Mexico, another developing country. The Cuban Soberana 2 vaccine is, um, is undertaking trials in Iran. Uh, Cuba is transferring technology uh, to Iran also. Uh, Cuba has been transferring technology to Venezuela. Bharat, a company from India, uh, has entered into several transfer of technology agreements in relation to COVID-19 vaccine uh, Bharat has developed. There has been an interesting cooperation between Argentina and Mexico in order to uh, produce uh, a vaccine uh, on the basis of AstraZeneca technology. Cancino Biological from China has made transfer of technology in this area to Pakistan. Sinopharm from China has transferred technology to a large number of countries, Bangladesh, Morocco, Argentina, Indonesia, Brazil, Malaysia, Algeria, Sri Lanka, Egypt. So it's, it's, very, it's very important then to know that on the basis of uh, scientific and technological developments in, uh, in the South, in, in developing countries, cooperation, South South cooperation has, has expanded, has provided um, solutions or contributed to the solutions to the problem that uh, was mentioned by the Comsub Secretary of the, the Humanity is, is facing today. But the science technology is one of the basis for such expanding social cooperation. <clears throat> there is another basis, and this is solidarity. So in the context of, of the COVID-19, there has been a manifestation of strong solidarity among the countries of the South um, through South South cooperation. Just to, to give a few examples, and these are not certainly exhaustive, Pakistan, for instance, donated masks to China when the COVID-19 started in, in this country. China has donated vaccines to a large number of countries, in particular in Africa, but not only in Africa. India has donated vaccines to neighboring countries, to small islands, included in the Caribbean. Even non-producer countries, such as Chile, which was just acquiring countries to, uh, to respond to the, to the local demand. Chile also shared uh, vaccines with other Latin American countries who were not able at that time to get vaccines, such as the case of Ecuador and Paraguay. Uh, Cuba announced recently that they will be able to provide the, the vaccines, the vaccines they have already approved to the Latin American uh, and Caribbean countries. So this, this COVID-19 has shown that South-South cooperation is a powerful tool of cooperation based on the one hand on the increased capacity of uh, the countries of the South in science and technology, but also on the principle of solidarity it has been proclaimed in many UN and other declaration, but has not been practiced by all uh, members of the international community. So just to finalize, let me, let me just commend the work that Comsans is doing in actively promoting uh, cooperation in the South in the of science technology. I was very impressed by the comments made by the Secretariat about the work that uh, Comsat is undertaking. Let me also highlight the important work that the United Nations Office of South Cooperation is doing. As was mentioned to streamline South South Cooperation in the UN system, also uh, to, to lead or to execute projects uh, that engage uh, different countries of the South uh, through cooperation. Um, the South Center in particular is working uh, together with Islamic Development Bank in order to uh, strengthen the capacity of developing countries to engage in South-South uh, cooperation. Then just to conclude, let, let, me, let, let me evoke uh, one of the great scientists from, from the South, Abdul Salam, uh, Pakistani Nobel Prize and a major promoter of science and technology, who said, and I, and I quote, scientific thought and its creation is the common and shared heritage of mankind. And this is the basis on which South-South cooperation should, should proceed. So science and technology should be available, accessible, and the products of, of innovation should be affordable to all countries. And, uh, and certainly South-South cooperation is a key tool in order to reach these uh, objectives. So thank you very much again for your kind invitation to participate at this meeting.
Mr. Huma, your mic is switched off. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So, so I will repeat <laughs> um, the introduction of uh, the speaker, the uh, next speaker. Um, but first, thank you so much, Dr. Korea, um, for sharing your substantive experience and recommendation on mainstreaming South-South cooperation uh, in context of post-pandemic recovery. And now I would like to invite Professor Aili Kun, who is the Assistant Executive Director of the Secretariat of the Alliance of International Science Organization, ANSO, China. Uh, she has served for IPO of Monsoon Asia Integrated Regional Study in Institute of Atmospheric Physics and Institute of Tibetan Plateau Research, Chinese Academy of Sciences, before moving to ANSO. Much of her research over the last two decades has focused on Asian monsoon climatology, global change, and sustainability research in Asian region. Uh, over to you, Dr. Lee Kun. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased and honored uh, to give a talk in this uh, important event hosted by COMSAT. Uh, so uh, I am uh, Ali Kun from uh, the ENSO Secretariat. Uh, I will give a brief introduction about uh, ENSO and ENSO's activity in South-South uh, cooperation. So uh, ENSO is formally uh, established in 2018, and ENSO is a non-governmental and non-profit international organization hosted by Chinese Academy of Sciences. And it was funded by 37 academies, institutes, universities, and international organizations around the world. By now, ENSO has 59 members and COMSAT is one of the ENSO members. So ENSO promotes the shared development and advances of UN SDGs, adheres to the joint consultation, joint effort and joint benefit principles, works on the ground through problem-driven and action-oriented. Also ENSO add green and sustainable elements to the quality Belt and Road Initiative. So ENSO is uh, hosted by Chinese Academy of Sciences. From 2013, after the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative, CAS uh, established 10 overseas centers. You can see that these 10 overseas centers are uh, in the South countries, especially in Asia. In Asia, in Central Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, uh, CAS actually put a tremendous effort to establish scientific cooperation with these Asian countries. And uh, the vision of ENSO is to aspire to be an international science organization to promote shared development and the advances of USDGs through catalyzing and implementing concrete programs, initiatives, and actions in science, technology, innovation, and capacity building, we call the STIC. And our major mission focusing on the four categories, the collaborative research, we are funding lots of research projects, and the science-based advisory, which, which means that we provide the scientific advices to policymakers. And we also have lots of activity focus on capacity building for South countries and also the technology transfer. I will give a brief introduction of uh, uh, so activity. We have a series of uh, uh, disseminations and publications, including the uh, website, uh, including the ENSO update, outreach, and highlight. Uh, and uh, we have uh, this, this, uh, this diagram shows the uh, major activities like uh, training, uh, scholarship, uh, visiting fellowship, uh, the associations, uh, research, and uh, ENSO prize and uh, ENSO workshops. Uh, so, uh, you know, by now, after uh, three years of development, we have established this health corridor, which 
uh, food security corridor, green technology corridor. In future, we will have this energy corridor. All these corridors are supported by ENSO projects, capacity building, training, and other activities. This is one example. This is the uh, ENSO associations. By now, we have established 19 international uh, ENSO associations, which is the operating arms of ENSO by integrating the networks of scientific and research unit of different countries to allow the easy and effective cooperation and links to assist the cross country and region collaborations. So this 19 associations focusing on the major challenge of the UN SDGs like climate change, natural disasters, agriculture and food security, water, land resources, public health, poverty elevation, and the green technology. This is the one example of ENSO disaster risk reduction uh, associations. Uh, the, one of the Chinese uh, institutes, they have developed this uh, debris flow forecast platform. And uh, it's by integration of uh, atmosphere science, soil science, uh, this uh, uh, land science and ecosystem sciences, they have developed a, a comprehensive system that can forecast the debris flow in mountain regions. And this system has been well verified and applied in Western China, and it is going to be applied to South Asia and other mountain regions through ENSO DRR. So you can see that through the uh, ENSO cooperation, the technology of on this natural uh, landslide and debris flows can be applied to other mountain countries. Uh, ENSO has a very comprehensive uh, capacity building program, which is including the ENSO scholarship, training project, ENSO prize, and visiting fellowship. ENSO scholarship will support 200 masters and 300 PhD students to come to China. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, this, all these uh, scholars uh, came from the developing countries. The number one is the Pakistan. Uh, number two is Nigeria. Number three is Kenya. And uh, we have also, uh, you know, supporting lots of uh, training uh, courses. This is one of our, uh, you know, significant uh, uh, training courses, uh, which is called the CropWatch Cloud, the Global Crop Monitoring System. This is also a comprehensive system using the remote sensing technology, the agricultural uh, research, and the uh, atmosphere ecosystem to assess the agricultural productivity by using remote sensing and land, uh, the, the in-situ observation in developing countries. So uh, after uh, we, we finish this uh, technical uh, uh, modeling of this uh, platform of this uh, uh, crop watch system, uh, by working with UNCTAD, uh, they are you know, connecting the, the South countries agricultural uh, administration. And then uh, we are uh, having this uh, capacity building training courses to the policymaker of the uh, agricultural administration in developing countries. You can see that uh, in last uh, uh, training course, there are 14 countries from Africa, from Southeast Asia, and from South America to join these uh, training courses. We also have the science-based advisories, uh, which including the, uh, the uh, broader area, which provide the scientific science-based uh, advices to the policymakers, national level, local level. And uh, ENSO also uh, from 2020 also makes great efforts 
in COVID-19. COVID so from the outburst of the, uh, the COVID-19, we have established the information platform to let the uh, ENSO members and partners and other countries know what this disease is and how to protect ourselves from this disease. And after that, we established the data sharing platform, uh, you know, supported by ENSO, also the forecasting, the COVID-19 forecasting uh, system in our website. Uh, we also donated, uh, you know, the testing case, the masks to, to, the, to other countries. We also uh, supported the symposium and workshops related to COVID-19. So uh, last year we have funded uh, five uh, projects related to the uh, COVID-19 by collaborating with the ENSO members and other partners. Uh, so uh, this is another important activity related to ENSO. Uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, they uh, created one vaccine. This is a protein a combination vaccine. And uh, through ENSO, we have organized more than 20 webinars with uh, the developing countries in the world. Uh, so this vaccine was uh, used in, uh, uh, adopted as the emergency use in Uzbekistan in February. In March, uh, it was registered as the, uh, the formal uh, vaccine for the Uzbekistan. So now uh, lots of countries started to use this vaccine uh, from, uh, from August, uh, this uh, company, uh, supported uh, by Chinese Academy of Sciences, they opened a factory in Uzbekistan, and uh, this uh, factory will uh, export the vaccine to other uh, South countries. So uh, this is my uh, last slide. I would like to share my uh, personal thinking of uh, uh, this uh, pandemic, post-pandemic world. Uh, related to the South-South cooperation. Uh, the unprecedented and last, long-lasting global pandemic has deepened the gap between the rich and the poor, men and women, city and rural, the global South and global North. The achievement of UN SDGs by 2030 will rely on the recovery and progress in global South in which South-South cooperation is more essential in post-pandemic world. Food and water security, natural disaster, public health and education facilitation are key challenges for South countries, which needs more funding and human resources in future. New technology and innovation in remote sensing, AI, remote learning and cloud computing are expected to be applied in South countries through enhanced cooperation. So we welcome various kinds of cooperation, suggestions, comments to ENSO. So we always welcome the broader cooperation with various partners. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lifin, for giving us your time. And I must say, Anso has been increasingly engaged in initiating and promoting South South Cooperation over the last year. So it is great that we have your perspective. So I have a small announcement to make that we, we need to have a one minute break. Sorry for the inconvenience, because we are uh, receiving the registration at this moment and we have to approve it. Uh, so it will take just a minute. Thank you.
Okay, thank you all for waiting. So uh, now I would like to invite our uh, next speaker from Inter Academy Partnership, Dr. Peter McGraw, uh, who is a coordinator at Inter Academy Partnership IAP, playing a key role in engaging IAP's 140 member academies in regional and global projects such as uh, science education program, the food and nutrition security and agriculture project, the young physician leaders program, and the activities focused on the UN sustainable development goals. He has also been serving as a coordinator of the TWAS, the World Academy of Sciences, Science uh, Policy and Science Diplomacy Unit, which has grown in activities and influence uh, with his efforts. Over to you, Dr. Peter McGraw. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak at this, this meeting on, on South-South cooperation, um, which of course is something that's at the heart of IAP activities, which I hope to introduce to you now. Um, let me try and share my screen and I'll get started with the, the presentation. I hope you can see it. Maybe you can give me a thumbs up if everybody can see that now. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, like I said, um, the inter-academy partnership and especially at academies of science and South-South cooperation. Um, I'm going to base it a little bit on this um, paper that we published a few years ago in the journal Science and Diplomacy. Um, academies of science as key instruments of science diplomacy, which I think is a key concept that I don't think has been mentioned yet in specifically in this meeting, but of course it's been alluded to sort of many times, you know, also with regards to vaccine diplomacy and the work of ANSO and so on. Uh, so let, let me just confirm to you probably what you already know that academies of science are typically independent organizations that commit to the role of advancing science and evidence in policy making. Um, by definition, they are merit based with their members, the individual scientists selected from the leading scientific minds within a country or region. And as such, they are viewed at home and abroad as places where scientific excellence across disciplines is represented. Um, in addition to their honorific roles of you know, honoring individual scientists, they also play a vital role because of the, the credibility that they have in informing the public and policymakers about problems and potential solutions, especially that, that science policy interface. And the credibility comes because of not only the excellence of the members and the, the scientific um, experiences, but also from the freedom from vested political and commercial interests. Um, and just as each academy in their own sort of national environment is represents an authoritative voice, the unified voice of academies you know, within regions and globally can have a great impact at international level. And so IAP itself, um, we have 146 member academies, academies of science, academies of medicine, and we have one academy of engineering um, from China. Um, we work also through four regional networks, um, YANAS in the Americas, ESAC in Europe, NASAC in Africa, and ASA in Asia. And I'm pleased to see that following my presentation, I think Professor Hoon Konu will, will give some further information on NASAC and the work that's done on the, the African continent. We have a general assembly every three years, and the last one, we agreed with our member academies to support these four main strategic priorities in our, in our strategic plan. Um, I won't go into them right here, but I'm going to touch on each one as I go through the, the following slides. Um, but before there, just a, a note that I sort of cross-checked, if you like, the membership of IAP and CompSats. And I know we do have one member in common, which is the Royal Scientific Society of Jordan. And CONSAPS also has a representation in, in Ghana, which is a country that as yet does not have an Academy of Science. Um, and maybe Professor Hunkonu will touch a little bit on that and efforts to build or establish academies in, in African countries where they don't yet um, exist. So coming to our strategic priorities, 
The first one is to build the capacity of and empower our regional networks of academies and their national members. And we do this through a number of activities, one of which is producing statements. These are on topical issues of science policy, the interface of science and policy. They are prepared by a working group of experts nominated by our member academies. So this is a way that our members, you know, from the richer countries and the poorer countries, we, we try to balance the membership of the working group so that we have good representation. Um, they produce a, a short four to six page document, which is then sent out to all our member academies, all 146. And we only release these documents once they are endorsed by the majority of our members. So there's two ways here for academies to get involved. One is by nominating experts to the working group and the second by the endorsement of the, the final statement itself. You can see we have two released so far this year, and there's a third one coming in, in the next couple of weeks. Sort of be no surprise as it touches on the issue of climate change and in and around the run up to the COP um, meetings that are happening in, in the UK um, later in the year. Um, another example of this building the capacity and empowering the academies is this food and nutrition and agriculture project that we ran between 2015 and 18. Um, it was run through four regional working groups. So each of those working group produced a report. Um, and as you can imagine, food security and agriculture are very different in, in the four regions. Um, and so each one had a, its regional focus. It had countries within Asia working together, with Africa working together, and so on. And we generated from these a fifth global synthesis report. Um, as I said, it was published in, in 2018. Based on these, and the sort of one of the impacts that is quite tangible, um, we were invited by the UN Secretary General's, the Scientific Committee of the Food Systems Summit um, to update these four reports and to present them again at the Science Days of the Food Systems Summit that took place in June this year. Um, the documents are there collated together and you can see again the, the four regional networks have been working together. And uh, the Food Systems Summit itself, I think, is taking place in a couple of days' time in, in New York. So I hope that the, the efforts of these academies working together will be feeding into to the discussions there in, in New York. Um, based on the same model of the four regional networks sort of working together on a regional basis, we have another project on climate change and health that is ongoing. Um, some of these regional reports will be published between now and the end of the year, maybe one or two into early next year. And then the fifth overview report that we plan again will be produced sort of the middle or the third quarter of 2022. So keep an eye on this one and looks at the interrelationships of climate change and health. Um, and just a final point on this strategic priority one, we also do encourage, I don't know if you can see all the slide, maybe I'll move myself to the bottom here. Um, we do encourage our regional networks to work together on topical issues that are important of them. And one here is the Americas and African academies working together on the issue of water security. Um, Moving to strategic priority two, um, and again, this is encouraging the academies to provide independent evidence-based authoritative advice on regional and national global issues. And one project here especially was this um, improving scientific input into global policy making, where we did actually produce a series of um, recommendations for how academies can take this forward and work nationally to contribute to their, um, their own national SDG processes. Um, 
another project that is ongoing, um, hopefully that the, our academies can get involved in, is this one on, on science in exile. It's a collaboration between TWAS, the World of Academy of Sciences, IAP, and ISC, the International Science Council. So it's our second such collaboration. Um, and I think this is particularly important for South-South collaboration as well, because a lot of the, the scientists that are being displaced from their countries, we think right now of, of Afghanistan, for example, um, but also Myanmar quite recently and Syria in the past. Um, these scientists very often are displaced into their neighboring countries. Jordan, for example, is hosting hundreds of thousands of refugees and amongst them scientists. Pakistan right now has an influx of, of people from Afghanistan, including scientists. And our aim is to try and keep these scientists working on, the, on their scientific careers, get the PhD students back into labs so that they can finish their, their studies and so on. Um, so, so as I said, they, these scientists need to be helped to integrate into their communities. And I think this is a perfect example where perhaps more South-South collaboration is required. Um, strategic priority three, for IAP um, is promoting the importance of science and research in education and literacy. Um, we've had a strong science education um, project running for a number of years, nearly 20 years now. It's focusing on inquiry-based science education. Um, and one project we've been working with the Smithsonian Science Education Center um, in Washington, D.C., producing a series of resources for teachers on different topics, on topics related to the Sustainable Development Goals, but also on COVID, which are very sort of topical. We also have our, as well as our website, our, our Twitter and LinkedIn accounts um, for getting the, the scientific, the science policy message out there to as wide an audience as possible. And then strategic power priority four uh, is building ourselves. You know, we always have to try and grow our, our own institutions um, as a progressive and more resilient global academies network. And I think it's clear that one of the ways to do this is to promote the engagement of women um, at all levels of the, the scientific sort of career ladder, as if you like, but also in the policy making and the science diplomacy arena that I mentioned. Um, next week, we will be releasing this report. It's a study, a survey of um, women in academies of science and in um, scientific unions carried out by Gender Insight, IAP and ISC. Um, it's an update to a 2015 report, so I'm glad to report that we, we have made a little progress. There are more women represented in the academies, but progress is very, very slow. Um, and it, it's clear that, you know, for IEP and academies and other organizations giving science advice, um, it's clear this quote from our, our president, um, stands true is that our policy recommendations can be considered inclusive only if academies represent the full diversity of their communities. And I think I will leave it with that and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Negron, for IAP's perspective. And uh, whenever we have your insight, it is uh, really important to us as it's also related to the work of ComSats, uh, supporting wider role of science and seeking evidence-based solutions to world most challenging problems through international cooperation. So now I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, uh, Professor Mahutan uh, Norbert uh, Honkonu, the president of Network of African Science Academy and the president of the Bannon uh, National Academy of Science, Arts and uh, Letters as well, a full professor of mathematics and physics at the University of Abomey, Calvary Bannon. Professor Honkono has been awarded for the excellency of his work, the prize of the World Academy of Sciences in 1996. 
the Tokyo University of Science President Award in 2015, the 2016 World Academy of Science CNR Rao Prize for Scientific Research for his incisive work on non-commutative and non-linear mathematics and his contribution to world-class mathematics education. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Chair. Let me now share. Distinguished guests, fellow scientists, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored to virtually join the Commission of Science and Technology for Sustainable Development in the South today on this webinar. At NASAC, we appreciate the value of partnership and the value addition that like-minded organization can bring on the science and technology landscape. Scientific research can be harnessed for the greater global good when we transcend disciplines and borders, when we collaborate and champion South-South cooperation. It is an open secret that with the appropriate infrastructure and political goodwill, Africa can undertake world-class science to overcome a myriad of societal challenges. Let me say at the very onset that NASAC believes that STEM education is critical to delivering the sustainable development goals. For this very reason, science education program is one of our network flagship programs and for which collaborative initiatives are continually sought for mutual benefit. We are inspired by CONCERT and will rely on its exemplary networking capabilities to enable us support STEM initiatives in Africa. On that note, let me tell you a little more about NASAC and our mandate. NASAC is the umbrella organization for a consortium of 28 merit-based science academies in Africa, with its secretariat based in Nairobi, Kenya. Our mandates call us to facilitate the creation of science academies in countries where none exist, to strengthen existing academies so that they can fulfill their mandates and also provide platforms for scientists both young and senior to deliberate and offer discourse in tackling Africa's most wicked challenges. With regard to the first objective, we rely heavily on eminent scientists within the uh, Sorry for the interruption, but we are unable to see the transition of your slides. You don't see? Yeah, yeah they, they, they are seeing the first slides and I guess this is the same program. Now, are you seeing? No, it's just uh, the first slide right now. Uh, the slides strange. are not moving. It's strange because you, it's you can, can you enlarge the slideshow and then run it? Can you enlarge the slideshow? Slideshow. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the view PowerPoint slides. Can you enlarge it to the yeah. full screen, the full view? It is what I'm doing. Okay. Then now? I would... Okay. Can you share my slide from there? Because I, I don't understand. It is well. Okay, okay. So I would request the technical team at Pomsa Secretariat to please see and play the presentation of Dr. Hontono. Because it is not um, well. Ah, sharing is imposed. I don't know why. Let me see. Why it is paused? I don't know. Uh, Professor Honkaro, uh, kindly wait for uh, just a few seconds. I, I'm sure that the technical team is uh, putting up your slide. 
Okay, so let, let you you want me to to stop now or what? Yeah, maybe stop sharing. Just for yeah, for just for a few seconds. Yeah, they will be sharing. They will be sharing your slides. Full full screen for yeah. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Next. Okay. Oh. Let me start from the very beginning. Previous one. Okay. At NASAC, we appreciate the value of partnership and the value addition that like minded organizations can bring on the science and technology landscape. Scientific research can be harnessed for the greater global good when we transcend disciplines and borders, when we collaborate and champion South to South cooperation. It is an open secret that with the appropriate infrastructure and political goodwill, Africa can undertake world-class science to overcome a myriad of societal challenges. Let me say at the very onset that NASAC believes that STEM education is critical to delivering the sustainable development goals. For this very reason, Science education programs is one of our next work flagship programs and for which collaborative initiatives are continually sought for mutual benefit. We are inspired by Comsat and will rely on its exemplary networking capabilities to enable us support STEM initiatives in Africa. On that note, let me tell you a little more about NASAC and our mandate. NASAC is the umbrella organization for and a consortium of 28 merit-based science academies in Africa with its secretariat based on Nairobi, Kenya. Our mandate call us to facilitate the creation of science academies in countries where none exist to strengthen existing academies so that they can fulfill their mandates and also provide platforms for scientists, both young and senior, to deliberate and offer discourse in tackling Africa's most wicked challenges. With regard to the first objective, we rely heavily on eminent scientists within a country to spur the interest towards creating science academies. Take partnerships, for example. We are yet to realize SDG 17 to revitalize the global partnerships for sustainable development. NASAC is able to provide a platform for various partners for, from academia, policy, and society to deliberate and build consensus on how to make meaningful progress on SDG 17, even if the focus is such that cooperation. That is convenient power, a major strength of science academies in the network. It is this convenient power that enables scientists in different countries to engage different sectors of society to offer practical solutions that influence policy and engage governance on these pertinent issues. Solutions that will convince African governments that strong and inclusive global partnerships and cooperation are in a prerequisite for SDGs. Partnership built upon values and principles, share vision and goals. Please go, go. Previous, previous one, please, please. Okay, partner built upon values and principles, share vision and goals, and one that places people and planet at the core. This is particularly crucial for the current global economy, which has sharply contracted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. To this end, NASA continues to promote scientific excellence, science for science among its scholars who are members of academies. NASA also facilitates the translation of research into practice, science for society, 
through provision of credible science advice to both policymakers and local communities. Next slide. The growing world population needs to know the vital contributions of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM in mitigation many societal challenges. Science literacy is an integral part of science education and STEM, extend knowledge and understanding of scientific concepts and processes to society at large. This makes it a valuable tool for decision-making, participation in civic and cultural affairs, and contributing to economic product productivity. Bridging this gap will provide a basis for engaging in STEM-related issues and offer innovative ideas that will move research to practice. As mentioned earlier, it is for this reason that the science education program remains NASA flagship program. NASA member academies continue to advise policymakers to strive towards building, towards building, please. So, the first unavoidable step is to bridge the digital div divide by improving Africa's internet connectivity with the rest of the world. The ICT sector can also support human capital development through specialized learning opportunities and creating of attractive work environment to nurture technological innovation. Most importantly, science academies strive to convince national governments to develop and align artificial intelligence strategies with the global and regional agenda so as to address social challenges. Social science education remains critical in the generalization of the fourth industrial revolution. Rapid digital transformation is possible in Africa full stem. However, that transformation, please. You, however, so the first unavoidable step is to bridge the digital divide by improving Africa's internet connectivity with the rest of the world. The ICT sector can also support human capital development through specialized learning opportunities and creating of attractive work environment to nurture technological innovation. Most importantly, science academies strive to convince national government to develop and align artificial intelligence strategies with the global and regional agenda so as to address socioeconomic challenges. Science education remains critical in the realization of the fourth industrial revolution. Rapid digital transformation is possible in Africa through STEM. However, that transformation must be based on a collaborative approach and defined by supporting leadership and backed by innovative but relevant technologies. Next slide. It is our hope that by fostering such sort cooperation, new initiatives for digital training that meet the demands and requirements of the labor market in most African countries will be pursued. Africa should also harness the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution, which is dominated by artificial intelligence and knowledge democratization. Academies champion such ambition, science education strategies for policymaking. The net effect of this will stimulate the interests of learners and the youth in STEM and integrate good ethical values and moral conduct. The basic pathway to attain the Africa we want in the African Union's Agenda 2063 is hinged on delivery of relevant science education at all levels of educated education. Next. The role of concepts, according to us. Concept has a crucial role to play in Africa. Striving for the sustainable socioeconomic uplifting of developing countries through the judicious use of science and technology is indeed a man of task. This gathering must join efforts to live 
no one behind, to leave no country behind. This webinar is only one on the many ways that concert, concert can provide an institutional platform for promoting such, such cooperation. We hope that through the institutions present here today, many more ways will be deliberated on that can help the realization of what mandates and foster inclusive post-pandemic recovery. As NASA continues to promote the voice of science to be heard by decision makers and policy makers in the continent and behind, we will count on ComSat support. For the realization of these SDGs, no one organization can speak alone. In partnership with other like-minded organizations, NASA is ready to strategically cooperate to lend our voice to demanding science-informed sustainable development in Africa. For CUMSAT and NASA to achieve this, consistent science policy dialogue must be pursued to augment relevant scientific research and champion the provision of adequate research infrastructure for STEM. That is the most expedient way to enable end users to fully experience and timely assess the benefits of such, such cooperation. Thank you for your kind attention. And I apologize for technical problems. Thank you, Dr. Honkun, for sharing uh, NASIC initiatives of building strong scientific network in Africa, training the next generation of academics in African network, uh, African continent, as well as uh, for your recommendations on uh, how concepts can lead um, the cooperation, international cooperation in science and technology in the uh, African region. So now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Muhammad Sharif. Uh, he's an advisor on science and technology at the Islamic World Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization uh, in Rabat, Morocco. Prior to join ISESCO, Dr. Sharif served as an assistant professor at King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, Saudi Arabia. He held various research positions within academic and industrial environment throughout his career with major emphasis on material synthesis and catalytic process development. Over to you, Dr. Sharif. Thank you very much, um, the chair. The Huma Baloch, the Honorable Executive Director Concerts, distinguished speakers, dear participants, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the Honorable Executive Director Concerts for his kind invitation to ICESCO to participate and share the experience of ICESCO in implementation of science and technology programs during COVID-19 era on such an important event. It is an honor for ICESCO and I consider this invitation as a sign of appreciation for our policy to develop science, technology, education, and culture in common member states of ICESCO and COMSERS. On behalf of ICESCO, I praise the leadership at COMSERS for the attention given to the topic under discussion in lines with United Nations Day for South South Cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, science, technology, and innovation all become necessary to address the global challenges. Science and gender equality particularly are vital for the achievement of international development goals, including the United Nations 2030 Agenda. We can be proud of the critical role played by national and international organizations around the globe at different stages of the fight against COVID-19, from developing techniques for testing to creating vaccines against the virus. Ladies and gentlemen, like many other international organizations, ICESCO also faced the challenges in implementation of its activities in member states. However, ICESCO is putting all its efforts to benefit its member states through all its means and some of its experience I would like to share with you all today. Please let me share our slides Okay. Do you see the slides? Hmm? Hmm? Uh, yes, we can see your slides, but it is best to find the... Uh, uh, Let me, and now? In the full image, yeah. What happened? 
So, thank you. Okay. The Islamic world, do, do you hear us, guys? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, fine. The Islamic World Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization is an international governmental organization specialized in the fields of education, science and culture, was established in 1982 and is based in Rabat, the beautiful city of Morocco. Uh, the vision of ISESCO is to be a global beacon of knowledge in education, science, culture and communication with its mission and the strategic objectives, which are six in number. ISESCO values the solidarity, coexistence, innovation, leadership, and transparency. We respect cultural and social individuality and uphold the priority. ISESCO rely on foresight studies and promote anticipatory approach. ISESCO is very much open and forward-looking organization, and it is flexible, capture the opportunity, and love the challenges. ISESCO works with its strategic partners by doing the specialized programs and joint, uh, on joint platforms through our national commissions. ISESCO has 54 national commissions around the Islamic world, which are presided by the concerned ministers. ISESCO is composed of three organs, General Conference, Executive Council, and General Directorate. Our General Council is composed of ministers or they are substituted, appointed by their governments. It convenes every three years, whereas Executive Council is also composed of representatives of each member state appointed and it convenes every year. The General Directorate is based in Rabat and is headed by Director General and the currently the Director General is Excellency Dr. Salem Al Malik. ISESCO at its headquarters contains five sectors, education, science and innovation, human and social sciences, culture and communication, partnership and international cooperation. Under the renewed the vision of ISESCO and the keen interest of Excellency Director General to catch up the fast intercultural developments in the importance of digitization era, ISESCO has established the Strategic Foresight Center, a center of Arabic for non-Arabic speakers, Civilizational Dialogue Center, and Islamic World Heritage Center at its headquarters in Rabat. ISESCO geographically is present in four regions, 17 countries in Africa, 21 in our region, 14 in Asia, two in Latin America, which makes the total number of 54 around the globe. ISESCO values and keeps the education at priority and believes that education is not the information, but the formation. So in this regard, ISESCO has established different educational, cultural, and media training centers other than the headquarter in different countries like in Chad, Niger, Malaysia, Kuwait, Avri, Mauritania, Sudan, Senegal, and in Pakistan. Priorities of ISESCO are women, children, youth, displaced people, and refugees. And in recognition of the women and their hard work in COVID era, ISESCO proclaimed the year 2021 as a year of women. ISESCO is formul formulating the social protection policies for children and developing the preschool education system and also supporting the cultural and artistic incentive prizes for children. In pr perspective of Year of Women, ISESCO has organized several high-level activities during the year 2021, like International Women's Day, International Day of Women and Girls in Science, ISESCO Forum on Women Leadership and Empowerment, International Symposium on Women and Youth, and also launched the program Women Pioneers Around the World. ISESCO also established the different projects and supported for the for the women in African countries and in capacity building 
We have given a number of scholarships, like 73 this year, where the 50% of them were allocated for the women and girls. Um, ISESCO holds periodic high-level sectorial gatherings, bringing together ministers and decision makers from member states to discuss major issues of common interest. And over the previous years, 32 ministerial conferences have been organized by ISESCO, which have given the outcome. 16 sector-specific strategies were adopted, six action programs, 18 declarations, and three commitments around the Islamic world. Ladies and gentlemen, now our experience, science and technology sector experience during the pandemic. During the COVID-19, ISESCO supported several projects, which includes the production of protective masks, supplies of artificial respirators, production of new devices with motion sensing technology in Uganda to, propo to promote the uh, safe hygiene. Also, ISESCO established the laboratories to maintain, uh, to manufacture disinfectants and provided the trainings in Mali, Gambia, Senegal, Guinea, and Uganda. A series of the remote lectures on dealing with disaster and also the water security issues for example, the water security for peace have been organized during the COVID-19 era. Water reservoirs were constructed in Anuzarjin, Makana regions of Mali during the, the COVID-19. As in the opening remarks of um, Excellency Director, uh, Executive Director of Comsets, he mentioned like this uh, capacity building and skills development we have also done a number of activities during the COVID where one of our flagship activity, which we are going to extend also to our different member countries, like in Malaysia in, German, in, in January 2022, we also uh, trained like thousands of the students, the graduates, and having the, the speakers and the mentors from the Comsers University. So it was held in, uh, December. Also, uh, science and technology sector observed the International Day of Women and Girls, where the Vice President of Azerbaijan, former President of Mauritius, Her Royal Highness Princess Sumaya, two Nobel laureates, one from the cabinet of uh, President Biden on the, uh, on the science and technology, European Parliament ministers, they spoke and they supported this International Day of Women and, Sci uh, Women and Girls in Science from the SSCO platform. Ladies and gentlemen, we do understand the importance of space ecosystem. This is the industry at this point is the $400 billion, which is going to be the $3 trillion industry in coming years. We, we saw that and then we, we felt that our member states, they are far behind in this era, in this area of uh, the science. And so we, we started to uh, do the awareness activities or awareness campaign for the space ecosystem, which is not only to send the people like in, in, uh, in the space, but we want to give the awareness to the, the graduates, to the students, to our professionals in our member states that how important this the space ecosystem is in agriculture disaster management etc cetera, etc cetera. so we held the space science importance challenges and emerging opportunities in space industry and islamic world international symposia this year in collaboration with space foundation united states foundation where we had the ceos of the different space organization astronauts cosmonauts and the cybersecurity centers and Professor Farooq Albas was also with us in this forum. Professor Farooq Albas was uh, the advisor to the late Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian president. After this, uh, the, uh, this symposia, uh, symposium, international symposium, we received a number of requests from our member states to, to do some 
the bigger or some to bring this European Space Agency, like the, the Western Space Agencies and also our member state agencies together and to give them more, more knowledge about it. So we are going to hold and uh, now the Global Space Science Forum, which we are thinking to make it a flagship program every year. We have already in, in consultation with the Saudi Space Commission to hold this this uh, forum next year in um, in Saudi Arabia and 2023 in Azerbaijan. And then then after that, we will be moving every year to different country with this uh, with this forum, which will be basically in partnership with Space Foundation. And this, if you see our International Advisory Committee, so we have the Mark Sirangelo is from the Syria Nevada Corporation, Chief Executive Officer of Saudi Space Commission, Professor Atau Rahman, Chairman, Prime Minister's Task Force on Science and Technology, Professor Farooq, Major General Ahmed Nadim, President of ISNET, and Chairman of ISA Suparko, Lieutenant General Harry, will, and Mark Kevin will be helping us in the in this forum in agriculture side we have also cooperated or collaborated and partnered with the comsat center uh, comsat uh, comsat the center for sustainability which uh, executive director honorable executive director mentioned to, during his remarks so to allow the high level experts to share their experience which will be which will provide the input in the implementation of projects on land degradation and neutrality in niger we also um, organized the training workshop in face to face in uh, in in nigeria in march 2021 to strengthen the capacity of niger experts to draft the bankable and competitive structuring the projects this is one of the uh, one of the uh, the activity which we did this year with the C triple uh, C S comsats. So the, the, we we did more than that, but this is the one of the activity for which was held for the discussion of experts on issue of preserving biodiversity, and it was in May 2020 uh, on biodiversity day. Uh, another flagship program, I would say the ICESCO has started, ICESCO Accelerator, and it is with the aim to create or to ignite 150 startups until 2025 in our member states. We just launched this program last week, face to face in Azerbaijan at Baku Higher School, Higher Oil School where around 70, uh, 70 graduates, they came up for the boot camp. And now uh, currently uh, this accelerator program is going on over there. So the pre uh, initially in the in three member countries like Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan or Pakistan, we are going to start. And in this way we will move to other the 10 more countries in 2022 than in our member states. The second accelerator program we just started yesterday opened virtually in Kazakhstan, Almaty in Kazakhstan, in collaboration partnership of the Ministry of Culture, Azerbaijan, the most business incubator, incubator and our SESCO National Commission, Azerbaijan. And then this, this will be the going on and we will be looking forward to have the ComSat's interest also if, if you, you think that you can also come up as a partner, supporter, whatever the way. Because I see that uh, uh, Honorable Executive Director mentioned that the 300 activities the ComSat has done over the previous years. So if, uh, if you go, go to your, your, your archive, you will see that the huge number of activities in the past have been, have, have been organized, have been held with, the, uh, with ICESCO. So we, we wish and we want that we should go uh, together again in the coming days and years. With this, I would say thank you so much for inviting us and listening us in this very important and a wonderful webinar. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Sharif. Um, and uh, we highly note uh, the efforts and initiative of by Cisco in setting up the solid scientific base for comprehensive development in the Islamic countries too, supporting all aspects of uh, educational, scientific, and uh, cultural development. And we are looking forward to receive the few details of the program that you mentioned, uh, uh, ICESCO program in Kazakhstan, the recent one. And uh, we really look forward to the continued cooperation uh, with the ICESCO. So with this, um, uh, we move to uh, the next presentation. We are pleased to have our next speaker, Dr. Adnan uh, Aliani from United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, UNSCAP. Um, Mr. Adnan Aliani is the Director of Strategy and Program Management Division at UNSCAP. In this post, he is responsible for coordinating SCAP program of work, budget, monitoring, and evaluation, uh, UNSCAP donor relationship, and its partnership with other agencies within and outside the UN family. Since 1st May of uh, 2021, Mr. Aliani has been serving as officer in charge of SCAP, your uh, sub-regional office for South and Southwest Asia, and is responsible for implementing uh, UNSCAP program of work in South Asia, strengthening relationship with SCAP member states, intergovernmental organization, and the UN country team in the sub-region. So I'm turning the virtual stage over to you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Homa. Uh, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good, af uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting SCAP to participate in this webinar. My presentation will will uh, focus on the contributions and the potential of South-South cooperation in helping the countries of Asia and the Pacific build back better from COVID-19 pandemic by advancing the sustainable development in, in, in the region. South-South and triangular cooperation has always been at the heart of SCAP's work. It underpins our research and analysis work, our intergovernmental and normative work, our technical assistance programs, and our technical assistance programs. South-South cooperation is also a key modality for our member states to address transboundary issues, uh, such as responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, trade and transport connectivity, as well as issues of common concern, such as poverty and inequalities, environment and ecosystem management, disaster risk reduction, and social development. Over the recent past, we have gone through an unprecedented socioeconomic crisis. No country and no one has been spared. The pandemic has clearly underscored the significance of inclusive and network multilateralism, particularly South-South and triangular cooperation. In these challenging times, by and large, the spirit of goodwill has prevailed and solidarity remains at the core of the responses of countries in Asia and the Pacific. Some examples of solution-oriented plans and strategies of regional and sub-regional South-South intergovernmental mechanisms include the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, the Pacific Islands Forums Secretariat's Pacific Humanitarian Pathway on COVID-19, the SARC COVID-19 Emergency Fund, Central Asia's Guidelines on Cross-Border and Transit uh, traffic facilitation measures, and the Northeast Asia Cooperation Initiative for Infectious Disease Control and Public Health. As we gradually move towards a post-COVID recovery, we must reinvigorate these regional and sub-regional multilateral mechanisms in order to build back better. This is exactly what the 62 members and associate member states of SCAP did at the commission session in April of, of this year. Through SCAP Commission Resolution 77-1, they agreed to work together to build back better from COVID-19 by accelerating the achievement of the 2030 agenda. Their common effort focuses on four broad areas of cooperation. Firstly, Member states agreed to focus on investing in social protection systems to act as automatic stabilizers, stimulating aggregate demand and thereby helping steady economies. The newly adopted action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific provides governments in the region with a shared vision and strategy for promoting uh, partnerships peer learning and sharing good practices, 
as well as identifying needs for technical assistance. Secondly, they agreed to align financial and economic stimuli with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is an opportune moment to work together to significantly reduce the constraints of fiscal resources within a country and among countries. Regional and sub-regional approaches could support the mobilization of multilateral resources, provide debt relief, and prevent defaults that lead to prolonged financial and economic downturns. Thirdly, they agreed to build resilient supply chains and increase cross-border connectivity. It is heartening to note that uh, coordinated sub-regional and regional approaches have been effective in facilitating trade and transport in these challenging times. In this regard, SCAP has several initiatives that advance and support uninterrupted flow of trade and transport, including the cross-border paperless trade agreement, the Asian highways, trans-Asian railways, and dry ports agreements, and the Asia-Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative to improve information connectivity, internet traffic and network management, e-resilience, and affordable broadband access to all. Finally, the countries of Asia and the Pacific agreed to, to restore the broken relationship between the people and the planet. The region is uniquely positioned to offer long lasting solutions to the climate change crisis. Regional and sub-regional cooperation frameworks are key instruments in ensuring conservation policies that focus on large scale integrated restoration of degraded ecosystems enhanced management of protected areas to increase resilience to natural disasters and on transboundary conservation, including biodiversity corridors. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, over the years, SCAP's member states have achieved remarkable economic development and technological progress. Many are now able to provide technical assistance and development finance as well as share innovative approaches to help other countries of the South uh, to attain sustainable development. To scale up support, SCAP, together with the government of Thailand and UNOSC, inaugurated the Asia Pacific Director General's Forum on South-South and Triangular Cooperation in June of 2018. The purpose of the Asia Pacific DG Forum is to serve as the regional platform for member states to deliberate on challenges and opportunities of South-South cooperation, to strengthen the institutional framework of South-South cooperation and triangular cooperation in Asia and the Pacific, and to share experiences, good practices, and success stories in promoting South-South and triangular cooperation. But collaboration amongst government is not sufficient, is not a sufficient determinant of results-oriented South-South cooperation. Cooperation amongst other stakeholders is also a key requirement. Over the years, SCAP established or catalyzed the establishment of regional networks of civil society organizations, such as the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, of private sector organizations, such as the SCAP Sustainable Business Network, of local governments, such as CityNet and UCLG ASPAC, and of think tanks, such as ArtNet, uh, a network of researchers and institutions working on issues of trade and investment, and SANS, a network of think tanks working on issues of sustainable development in South Asia. We have, of course, worked extensively uh, with COMSAT and hope to continue working closely with COMSAT. We hope that COMSAT and all these other stakeholders will continue to promote South-South collaboration in Asia and the Pacific, and help countries of the region build back better from the pandemic and prepare themselves for future crises, particularly that of climate change. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, 
thank you uh, thank you so much dr aliani for your time and for accepting our invitation at the very last moment and uh, sharing with us at how un scab is promoting economic and social uh, development through regional and sub regional cooperation and integration in the, uh, in the two means so um, thank you again and uh, before moving to the discussion session i want to convey my heartfelt thanks to our awesome lineup of panelists and uh, of this uh, webinar your willingness to lend your precious time and share your uh, expertise uh, so others might benefit is commendable and genuinely ap appreciated so uh, i will now turn uh, this stage over to dr kamran jahangi who is the advisor at comsec secretariat and uh, uh, who will serve as a moderator for uh, this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much all the, to all the panelists who have uh, really enlightened us on, on this very major uh, issue of post-pandemic recovery and inclusiveness. I'm really thankful to the Executive Director of Access to this situation and make it possible for us to hold such an important uh, in the backdrop of uh, what is happening in the country. Uh, whenever there is a challenge to humanity in general, uh, it transcends all the human activity and the areas of human activity. So today we see transport networks being disrupted, health facilities being you know, overworked, and education being disrupted. So the socioeconomic life uh, being, being stressed to the and we have greater and wider have and have nots, be it in the field of you know, gender disparity and uh, the divide between developing and developed world, south and north. Uh, I was uh, really uh, educated uh, from one of our colleagues telling us that uh, from six to 20% of what the south has reached in research and development as compared to from 94 to 80% today by the West. So by the same proportion, uh, almost 80% of the world population lives in the South and 20% approximately population of the world lives in the West. So, you know, they are more resourceful in terms of technology, know-how and r and However, this pandemic has really opened up new avenues uh, to for soul searching and to finding ways and means for more cooperative R&D and moving in a direction where we have more equitable resources available to majority of uh, the inhabitants of the world. Uh, from the different presentations, which were beautifully I mean, based and presented by all the presenters, we see that there is a lot of wonderful work going on by organizations which are further have interface with hundreds of organizations working with it in partnership. So with so many organizations working with so many partners, the synergy effect that can really spill over to the policy makers as well as to the stakeholders, uh, the recipients of these benefits, I'm sure it's enormous. So, uh, I mean, I will not go into each and every uh, presentation, or I will not pick up points from there. Uh, because of the paucity of time, I will request uh, organizers to take up to three questions, because we have a question on the session. Uh, I will request you to please, uh, your questions should be focused on uh, what you would want to know more in one of the presentations. Because if we talk about general uh, policy issues, uh, then everyone would like to answer and we will not be able to uh, uh, have that much of time. So the house is open for questions. Omar, there is no question. Correct. My okay. end, uh, no question has been received. Uh, the difference between the Spanish flu, the pandemic at, at that point in time, and what we have today, I think the, the major difference that we have today is the communication technology. 
and its application. Uh, today, we are very well informed. Today, we can share our experiences, our successes, our failures. So, it has really empowered uh, the world, the, the whole population of the world. So, I think whatever we have discussed today, uh, we can really uh, form more partnerships wherever they are not, like uh, the South South Galaxy platform is available, Popsets platform is available, uh, the South Centers platform is available. They are, they are, these are all organizations which are willing to accept more partners. So I'm sure that if, if uh, we all make an effort, uh, we, we can be better informed, better prepared, God forbid, for another disaster of this nature. Uh, so with that, I, I really thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Excuse me, Dr. Kamran. Uh, I have one question from uh, one of the, uh, our colleague from Comsec headquarters, Dr. Kessel Nawab, uh, because the mic is not near to him. So I'm just on his behalf, I'm asking this question. This question is for the representative of ANSO, Dr. I. Liukin. And uh, he asked that according to the recent report, Pathway to Peace, World Bank and UN report, conflict and violence are on the rise. The report found that by 2030, over half of the world population will be living in the country affected by high levels of violence, and this figure is expected to rise further. So China being the major stakeholder in the global development, uh, how the, uh, um, the South South Corporation is a path to inclusive peace, if yes, how and why? That's it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I'm a little bit, uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I can represent in Chinese government or not. Uh, but uh, I think, I think, you know, uh, during the pandemic, uh, Chinese government has been making great effort uh, to support uh, the uh, global South countries to COVID, the COVID-19. That is, uh, I think, uh, you know, to show that, uh, you know, as the leader of the global South countries, uh, China is, uh, you know, uh, give uh, many support uh, in uh, various, uh, you know, various uh, fields. Um, so uh, from uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, actually uh, we have uh, more than 100 institutes uh, covering most of the scientific areas, uh, including research, including technology innovation. So, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, establishment of ANSO, Alliance of International Science Organizations, actually is to support the scientific cooperation. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I shared my uh, personal idea, also my uh, view of uh, post-pandemic world. Actually, uh, you know, uh, we realized that, uh, you know, this pandemic, uh, the most vulnerable, uh, you know, uh, areas uh, and vulnerable countries, always uh, the country with the problem of poverty. Uh, the the problem of uh, you know uh, this uh, food security issues. So uh, uh, from uh, Enso, uh, from Chinese Academy of Sciences, we think from the following years after the pandemic, the most important issue is that to secure the food issues to secure this uh, water supply issues and uh, how to uh, solve the poverty issues. This is the basis for the South-South cooperation. So we have made great effort to let scientists, more and more scientists to be involved in this food security, water security, and ecosystem services security issues. So all these issues related how fast the recovery of the global South countries. And uh, the second, I think, is that uh, we aware that, you know, this wealth can be, can be last long time. So lots of new technologies such as remote learning, 
such as remote sensing, big data, AI, such, a, such kind of technology should be applied to the global South countries. And the Chinese Academy of Sciences as well as Chinese government is trying to apply more technologies to the global South countries to help the food issues, the water issues, natural disaster issues, to be more resilient to these natural disasters. So that's my understanding of, you know, Chinese position of uh, leading the global South, uh, you know, South-South uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I have a question. Okay. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Peter and uh, Mr. Hontong. Oh, Hong Kong. Are you there, sir? Sir, I would like to know uh, how can we strengthen the mechanism of science advisory? Uh, which is basically meant for the policymakers and concerts being an intergovernmental organization, it is important for us. Um, okay, if I understand your question correctly, is how, how do we transmit the, the advice, the policy advice to the policymakers? Um, it's always difficult. It has to be said, there are, there are various mechanisms. So of course, the academies of sciences are you know, highly regarded institutions in a number of countries. We've just heard from the previous, from Ali Kun, about how the Chinese Academy of Sciences is very influential, not only in China, but elsewhere too. The same goes for the, you know, the Royal Society in the UK and many other academies. Um, it's not always the case. Some newly founded academies are much weaker. Um, they're not well funded. But the, the part of the IAP plays is to first link them to other academies so that the voice can be stronger in a region. And the inverse of that is that the national, the sort of smaller, weaker national academies can use that what they learn and the sort of joint voice from their neighbors to increase their own um, credibility and effect in, in their own countries. Um, in the most cases, academies are supported financially by governments. So there is also this um, connection there. Um, we, we hope they leverage that to get the messages to the, the relevant, the Minister of Science, the Minister of Education, energy, agriculture, whatever might be the topic. It's not always easy. Um, and then there are two um, different ways, if you like, that the academies have to be aware of. One is the new emerging issues in science, and this is what we're very good at. We can identify those, we can study those, synthesize the new science, and present our reports, our statements, and so on. Um, but that is on a sort of time scale that is, um, I would say, dictated, if you like, by the science and by the scientific community. Whereas there is also, of course, a policy making cycle. And there are moments where policymakers are interested in, um, you know, water management issues or climate right now, climate change issues, um, biodiversity issues, whatever it might be. And sort of part of the secret, I think, is the academies linking with UN agencies. And I think we've linked with UNESCAP in, in earlier this year to try and feed into some of those um, policy maker discussion cycles to really make sure that our advice is reaching the policymakers in the right moment for their own cycles so that they can use it, consider it, and hopefully implement it. Um, I hope that answers your question. Pretty well, thank you. I, I, just, I just would want to ask uh, Professor Manuku to add to this piece. Okay, can I add something? So oh, please, go ahead. Okay, as uh, already said by uh, uh, Peter, it is very difficult because of the matter of communication. You know, scientists have their 
way of communication, which is very different from the way uh, policymakers accept to communicate. So we, we treat, for example, crucial issues like uh, those of the SDGs. We write a report and convey our recommendations to policymakers and uh, uh, local or local communities. The policymakers also can appeal for our advice on given uh, issues. But the, the, all these, our recommendation remains recommendation. <laughs> and the decision <laughs> is, uh, is always political. If the recommendations uh, do not go in the sense of policymakers, they arrange in their way. It is because the temporality of science is different of temporality of politics. Uh, politics has a mandate uh, to, to respond to, uh, up, uh, to define needs of uh, population. But our recommendation, science has long-term uh, period to be uh, to, to, to make evident uh, the recommendation we, we, we give. So such difference between political temp uh, temporality and scientific temporality can make a, a very big difference between the recommendation and the application in concrete way. Thank you. And uh, well, from the pool of questions, I will take up the last question for today's session. That is from Elena Kumari. What are the possibilities where South-South long-term cooperation could be enhanced through digital platforms in the new norm? So anyone who wants to answer this question, the house will. I, I I can I can uh, uh, answer I think uh, as my understanding uh, you know uh, the UNESCO is promoting the open science it is very broad perspective of uh, you know involving everybody to science uh, learning to scientific knowledge understanding so uh, uh, I I think that is uh, leading the uh, you know United Nations mainstream of uh, uh, transferring the scientific knowledge to other stakeholders. That is very important movement from the United Nations. Uh, from uh, you know uh, China and uh, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, actually, this uh, how to better use the cloud technology. Because of this pandemic, uh, people cannot uh, you know join together. So uh, how to use the cloud technology to do uh, the, the 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 education? To uh, to do the uh, you know uh, uh, the, even the modeling issues can be you know uh, using the cloud resources to compute uh, you know uh, instead of the computers by themselves. So such kind of technology will support the global South countries a lot, I think. So uh, Chinese Academ Academy of Sciences by working with other uh, cloud uh, technology uh, uh, company, I think. They are, uh, you know, uh, uh, establishing, developing lots of uh, uh, applications of uh, cloud technology to let the common users to use more scientific, uh, you know, uh, 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 like modeling, like remote learning, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, data storage, such kind of te technology will be more popular in future. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Adnan would want to add to this, please, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think we are moving as, 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 as the, 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 the person who asked the question uh, herself or himself uh, more or less answered, we are moving to a new normal and I think we are moving uh, to, towards a hybrid blended uh, approach to, to, to both learning uh, as well as to South-South to cooperation. 
a lot of our meetings in, in, in SCAP, uh, and, and the SCAP, as you know, is an intergovernmental organization. A lot of our meetings that deal with uh, technical issues, uh, capacity development or training workshops, or even to discuss uh, uh, specific uh, uh, scientific issues, uh, are being done through, through remote uh, learning methodologies. But member states still insist on physical face-to-face -face meetings where they have to negotiate treaties or agreements or even resolutions. They are very, very reluctant to do this uh, through remote means. So I think in the future, as we move forward to a new normal, uh, uh, the, we would move towards a blended or hybrid uh, approach where a majority of member states who can participate physically will be there, but then the opportunities for member states who cannot participate uh, and, and, and be connected remotely uh, will also be there. Uh, and I think that is going to be the new normal as we move forward. Thank you. Yes, we, we, we all agree. This, this is the new normal and this is the new normal. So, so, so come on, uh, we have uh, two more questions left on the screen, if you can see it, uh, and if you have time. Okay, yes, so the last two questions. Because okay, one question is from uh, Mr. Farhan Ansari from Comsex, and he asked this question to uh, the South Center, Dr. Carlos, the South South Cooperation versus South North South Triangular Cooperation. Uh, which approach is more effective today? Dr. Carlos, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Well, it's difficult to say which approach is, is more efficient. Or what we know is that uh, South-South cooperation complements North-South cooperation. And this also applies to South-South triangular cooperation. So what we see, uh, however, is that while North-South cooperation has stagnated, for instance, uh, ODA, although increasing 2020 by 3.5%, most of this additional money has been uh, used uh, in the countries that provide the support for refugees uh, within the, the countries themselves. So there, there hasn't been a real, real increase. Proportionate to the challenges that uh, developing countries have faced during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, on, in contrast to this, as I, I did mention, sub South cooperation has continued to expand. And I, I did mention a number of examples of South South co cooperation, collaboration uh, through donations, through um, scientific uh, cooperation and so forth. So uh, South South cooperation is becoming uh, growingly an important means for uh, development. And uh, this, this, however, will not um, um, avoid the, the question that um, that uh, North-South cooperation should continue, or should increase. So it's not at the level that uh, the international community has expected. And, and therefore, we need to continue having a combination of both. But uh, South-South cooperation is, is very efficient and uh, let's uh, all engage in trying to strengthen the capacity of developing countries to use uh, effectively South-South cooperation, both as providers and as beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Omar, next question. Uh, next question we have from uh, Mr. Mahmoud from uh, the Ministry of Higher Education in Palestine, I guess if I'm not wrong. Do you think that according to this pandemic, a higher need for increasing budget specialized for raising capacity in disaster risk reduction? and prepared required plans and resources for crisis management uh, in a better manner and how we can do that in collaborative effort regionally and globally. So he has put this question to everyone who would like to answer. Yes, it's an open question. So whichever panelists want to contribute, please go ahead. Uh, if I may come in here. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, clearly, as, as we move forward and, and, and clearly as, as, as global leaders and, and, and countries of, of, of the world 
uh, in, are increasingly failing to meet their commitments on, on climate change, uh, climate change, uh, climate related disasters are, are likely to increase. Yeah, and we're already seeing that happen around the world. Uh, a greater intensity of disasters and greater frequency of disasters. So disaster risk uh, management uh, is, 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 uh, is very important. Disaster risk planning is even more important than that. Uh, in, in Asia Pacific, and I can only talk of Asia Pacific because SCAP's, uh, 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 SCAP's uh, scope is limited to Asia Pacific, we have set up several mechanisms to promote increased uh, uh, disaster risk management uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, a good example is our regional center in Iran. It's called the Asia Pacific uh, uh, App Demis Asia Pacific uh, Disaster Information Management Center. And the idea there is uh, to, uh, to alert member states uh, of impending disasters uh, before they hit so that uh, the, 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 the mitigation plans could be put in place uh, earlier. Yeah, but, but countries would increasingly have to invest in disaster risk uh, management and disaster risk plans to avoid dis uh, disasters becoming economic crisis. Thank you. Uh, I will now request the Honorable Executive Director Concerts to conclude today's session. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm thankful to all the distinguished guests and speakers for the talk, the presentation that were for the interactive session, the observations which you made, the experiences which you shared and the recommendation and the solution which you suggested were definitely of very, very high quality. I must uh, admire you for that and my great commendation for that. And one thing uh, uh, which uh, in our discussion, uh, uh, which I would like to conclude that the world we are living in definitely is we have to set new normals in the post COVID. Secondly, exclusivity is no choice, not for any individual, not for any nation. And thirdly, we are living in more independent, interdependent world. So for that, we have to do a collaborative approach. And I'm sure this webinar and this platform is just one of the platforms for such collaborative work. The speakers, the honorable speakers, their suggestions were quite valuable. The two major dangers to humanity in regard to climate change and pandemic, they have exposed the gap between the politics and the uh, science in the shape of healthcare system because no healthcare system, neither in the North nor in the South, were able enough to cater for this pandemic. So the, the need of the order is to have, as one of the honorable speakers highlighted, more of a blended or a hybrid system, blended we need to blend science with the politics, with the policy recipes so that we may go for the, the entire humanity through regional approaches or through global platforms may come up with such solutions that the humanity this time, next time would be in a better position to co combat any disaster emanating from the climate change or any disaster in regard to the health system uh, emanating from any pandemic. With, with these words, I thank you once again for all for very, very educative and very interactive session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nazir. And uh, I think um, this is a time to wrap up now. Uh, but uh, before wrapping up, uh, there is one small request that we need to have a virtual group photo. So I would ask all the participants, speakers, to please turn on their camera for the virtual group photo. Excuse me. 
No? Could I talk, please? Dr. Homa? Yeah, yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Can you briefly, uh, you briefly for, introduce? Uh, this is, uh, yes, my name is uh, Dr. Ali, uh, Deputy Minister of Higher Education in Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for this event. It's good uh, uh, to sit with the, all the people. Uh, and thank you very much for um, concentrating uh, this topic. Uh, I hope all organizations take care about uh, countries which, uh, which um, has conflict, like Yemen, like Iraq, like uh, Libya, like uh, for everything you can, you can help these countries. This is my, this is uh, my, uh, uh, what, what, what uh, can I say? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Um, uh, I would like to inform that this webinar will be archived and posted on our uh, website. And I would like to thank once again to our speakers and uh, the audience for participating. And I would also like to thank the, Comsets, uh, the team of Comsets Secretariat for hosting this and to the Ministry of, for Science and Technology for their support. We won't be able to put out this webinar without them. So finally, thank you and have a good day and bye-bye. Thank you very much for the time. All the high quality.